Hi, I'm Katie Hess with Liquor Girl. Thanks for joining us today. We've got Dr. Jake here with our agronomy research wrap up for this year. You guys have asked for this for the last few years and we're finally making him do it this year. She's pushing me to have all this data organized and statistics done. I don't like it, but we're here. Yeah, so in the past we have put this in a nice little research book like this, but we've moved to more of a digital platform. So if you would like the book, our latest version is still 2019. Uh, everything else is gonna be on the website or on our digital platform, social media platforms. Um, Jake, there's a lot of new folks that have joined us over the last year, and I think it's time for you to reintroduce yourself. How did you get to be Dr. Jake Boston Kemper? Yeah, Katie, I don't like to talk about myself at all. Oh no. Uh, but I will do it for you For today. the sake of us, yeah, for yes. For the sake of us. Okay, so in brief, I grew up on a small farm, grandpa's farm, uh, north of St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, I went to school to study ag because that's all I knew. Right, right. Like a lot farm of kids. Yeah. Um, and I ended up getting a degree in ag science. Uh, ag science is a catch-all degree for I don't know what I want to do, but I love ag. However, during the process, I fell in love with agronomy, crop production, soil science. And, uh, and so, your wife. And my wife. That's right. That's <laughs> right. My, my wife. And through all that, I decided that I was so passionate about crop production that I wanted to go on to school. So I went to Oklahoma State, got a master's degree in plant and soil sciences, had a great experience specifically down there. I was involved in lots of soil fertility research, but specifically I looked at, you know, how does nitrogen management differ or how should a farmer think about nitrogen management in irrigated corn in Oklahoma versus dryland corn? Because in irrigated corn, we could be talking about 300 bushels. In dryland corn, we could be talking about nothing or 100. I mean, so quite a different regime of what you might expect for yield. So how does nitrogen management need to differ in those environments, okay? So after that, I went to I went into industry, worked for a multinational uh, ag company, uh, did uh, practical production research for them, uh, both on, on research farms, uh, their research farms, as well as uh, on farm with farmers. Um, somewhere along the line, I decided I got a harebrained idea that I wanted to go back to school. Uh, the girl that I met at, at Northwest Missouri State is now my wife. And I had to convince her that I should go back to school, but I did sell her on it, Katie. So you yeah. should be shooting so proud of me. So you can do something. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> so I went back to school uh, for another four years at the University of Illinois, finished with a PhD in crop sciences. Again, was involved in many more experiments than I can even remember there. Um, but your focus was primarily soybean. Uh, my my PhD research is in soybean, but we did a lot of corn trials. Okay. <laughs> Um, so yes, what I defended was my was my the soybean research that I did there, looking at you know if if we're going to start planting beans earlier, which is now pretty common. At the time, it was becoming common. The question I was trying to answer was how do your management practices need to change with early planting? Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll leave it at that for today. Um, but that was my focus. But we did lots of corn research and lots of other soybean research. Um, and you've been at Liquor Grow now for seven been at or eight Grow years? Now for about seven and a half years. Uh, I've, I've really thoroughly enjoyed working here. I'm very, still very passionate about research and helping farmers, most importantly, with my research. So let's jump into that, the research piece. There was one research farm when you got here. We currently have three. You move them around from time to time. Can you talk a little bit about that? I can. Before we do that, you wanted me to mention some of the professional organizations I'm involved oh, with. Oh, yeah. I'm involved. I'm, I'm, I'm on the uh, Nutrient Research and Education Council board for the state of Illinois, and I am the president of the Research and Education Committee for the Fluid Fertilizer Foundation. So you asked about the research plots. So yes. So when I got here, well, the reason I came to work here, it's for a bunch of reasons, but one reason was this company, and Scott and Hub in particular, the owners, are very serious about promoting and providing products that actually work and provide ROI, okay? And they, for a long time, they've had, you know, a research group, all right? But when we got here, well, we had one site, and which is good, that's, that's something. But I said, if that's really your objective, we need more sites. <laughs> so today we have three or four sites, depending on the year. Uh, but you know, we try to get out there and sample a lot of our geography that we do business with in, and, and, and try to get on as many farms as we can that would represent what our customers farm in. So these research farms, they're not like the strip trials that you see going down the road where there's six or eight hybrids, you know, a thousand feet long. 
We're talking replicated small trial. Yep. So Katie, I've been involved in a lot of both. So, you know, there's really two ways to think about research and that's the strip trial focus where we, you know, do big strips, long strips with commercial equipment and fields. And I've been involved in a lot of that and that can be great. The limitation is, you know, you can't have a farmer easily go from zero pounds of nitrogen to 250 pounds with you know, their equipment, you know, it depends. But we want to do all kinds of rates and different, all kinds of different products and it gets really complicated and really messy really quick, okay? So I've done some on-farm research here, but I've, I've kind of decided that it's better in the end if I focus on small plot research. So that means that these plots where I test this stuff are, are four 30 inch rows wide by 30 feet long. They're replicated six to eight times. They're all randomized, so they're statistically valid studies. And you know, on one hand, you know, they're they're maybe not as nice as long rep, uh, strip trials, but I can test a lot more stuff, and I can do a lot more unique things because I have a lot more flexibility with my research equipment. Okay, and I I, I always say, and I'll never say that my what I find is the be all to end all. That's not the case. So I'm not that worried about it. Because at the end of the day, I'm looking at all this stuff and I'm trying to funnel it down to a few products and a few practices that I find to work. And my recommendation would be now, it's, 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 it's time for you to take over the retail salesman and the farmer to understand if this works on your farm. Jake, it always amazes me when we go to these meetings and a farmer will come up and say, have you heard of this new product that just came out? And Jake will say, well, yeah, I've been testing that for three years in my research trial. So I think you really have your thumb on what's coming out in the industry and what's available to farmers. Um, and I know today we've got about six, seven different things that you've been trying and that you're really starting to see some benefits from. So why don't we jump right into that and get going? Sounds good, Katie. We'll start off by talking about an in inoculant that I've been testing for uh, four or five years, five or six years now. I've, I've been looking at it for a long time. Um, and it's continued to impress me. Um, the product name is MicroAZ. It's an in bacterial inoculant that you would apply with either in starter or out of starter placed close to the roof, okay? I'm gonna get into just a little bit of the details, but I have talked pretty extensively about the specific mode of action of this product and other uh, discussions we've had online, and perhaps we can dig those up and, and, and provide those links. But very briefly, the bacteria does two things to the, to the corn crop. It, it produces a plant growth regulator that stimulates fine root hair development. And why that is so important, Katie, is the majority of the root hair area is actually in the root hairs. And that's really important for nutrient uptake and particularly important for water uptake, okay? And what I have seen historically with this product is that in stress, stressier environments, it tends to be pretty darn consistent. In very high yield environments, up until now, you know, I wouldn't say that it's been super consistent, but in tougher growing environments, it's been pretty consistent. Now there is something that happened this year that's, that's kind of really got me uh, thinking differently about that. So in 2019, I believe it was, I had a plot up in Hampton, Iowa, and it, that plot averaged like 280, pretty high yields for, for Hampton, Iowa, that's, that's really good. And this product increased yields, I forget off the cuff, but like eight bushels per acre, seven, eight bushels per acre. And, it was, and, and at yield levels of 280, I was like, wow. Now the interesting thing about that site is it had a dry late growing season. They were pretty dry. Um, and so that all brings me back to this root hair production, root hair development, and what that means for water uptake. And so the long-term, you know, yield, average yield increase from this product's been like 4.4 bushels per acre. And that isn't a bunch, but you know, it only costs like five or six bucks an acre. So it's still something that's reasonably profitable, okay? This year, um, I have been blown away with what it did at all three research sites. So at Illinois City, it increased yield eight bushels per acre. At uh, Chillicothe, it increased yields nine bushels per acre. <laughs> and at Walnut, it increased yields also nine bushels per acre. So do you think that has something to do with the drier season that we had? Yeah, so the yield levels at these different sites range from about 180 bushel to all the way up to about 270 bushel, okay? 
And at those two high yielding sites, um, we still had nine bushel yield increases. And, and if you think about our growing season, and, and particularly as I think about these sites, we weren't in a severe drought at any point in time, but we were kind of dry a good majority of the season at times, right? And I think that when I think back to my 2019 experience at Hampton and I think about this year, the, the, the conditions at those plots are pretty similar. We had high yield potentials, but relatively dry. And again, we had that this year at these sites and man, it really increased yields this year. So I think I need to change my thought process, process about it's just something for stressier environments. I think it's something for all yield environments, but it just works particularly well when we get into drier conditions, okay? So, you know, I, you know, I, I have to be honest, you know, it, it, nothing's bulletproof, it's not bulletproof, but for five, six bucks an acre, man, it's, it's providing some pretty dramatic yield increases in some cases. Okay, now that the folks have heard all about it, go back and say, how do you apply this? You apply it in furrow with starter fertilizer, or you could with water, but with starter fertilizer, in furrow or two by two. And what if you don't have a starter set on your planter? So um, up until this point, I, I haven't looked any further, but I was actually just talking to their national sales manager and one of their research people before we got on this video. I think I'm gonna try a planter box inoculant next year, given the results that I've had with the in furrow uh, version of this. Um, but there are some planter box inoculants with this Azosperly Umbrella Sensei bacteria in it that this Terramex company sells. Um, I think I'm going to try that next year. So that would really open up the market. Um, but I wouldn't do it until I've tested it. You know, you don't, you don't know, and I have learned more than anybody, I think, that when you start putting these inoculants on seed treatment or in insecticides or in herbicides, those things can be pretty detrimental to the, to the bacteria themselves. So I would not... I'm not recommending that, but I am telling you I'm gonna be testing that because of because of what I've seen with the infrared inoculant. Okay, Jake, here's our next product. It's a Veil T5. I know you've been working on it for a lot of years now, and this fall we've actually been using this product a lot with our own fertilizer application. So let's jump right into what you're seeing with a Veil T5 and what the folks at home can still do this fall and next spring. All right, so a Veil T5. So, um, Yes, I have been working with this product for a long time as well, and uh, it, it's a product that can be applied in furrow, okay? And it's probably no wonder that we've got two products now I've talked about in furrow because I put a lot of focus on that uh, when I started, and it's taken some time, but I've, I've, you know, we've, we've arrived at some places where I'm pretty darn confident about a couple in furrow products now, right? And so that's why we're talking about it. So a Bale T5 can be applied in furrow, and we'll back up and talk about that a little bit more in a minute but it can also be applied with our liquid suspension fertilizers, okay? And so uh, when we first started using it, a Bale T5 basically wasn't labeled for suspension fertilizer. I mean, that's the kind of R&D stuff that I have to do here. So I had to figure out, not only did it work, period, but at what rate should we use it with suspension fertilizer? So basically I had to do a rate study, and I did that rate study at three locations. And what I concluded is that uh, the nine ounce rate uh, was the most profitable rate. Okay, so I looked at zero, obviously six, nine, and twelve, and I found that yields increased, but they, you know, they started to plateau at that twelve ounce rate. So bottom line is, you know, we were seeing, on average, over those three locations, about a nine to thirteen bushel yield increase, and that's pretty darn exciting. Um, and the reason I even did that study with suspension fertilizers because of what I saw with it in furrow. All right. So um, I think that the average yield increase I've seen in furrow with a Bale T5 is about 7.7 .7 bushels per acre. Now that's historically kind of over all the locations that I've tested it at. This year, the yield increase is larger. It's about 12 bushels per acre. That's only at one site this year. I mean, it's, it's a product that I've decided that works as advertised. So I've slowed down on kind of how much I've tested it, but I did have it in one study this year and it increased yields 12 bushels per acre uh, this growing season. So what's causing this to increase the bushels, Jake? Yeah, so what's it do? this is another one that <laughs> I could spend all day on, but it's a phosphorus enhancement product, okay? So it, it, it keeps phosphorus available longer is the bottom line, okay? And um, so is that similar to what our nitrogen stabilizers do for nitrogen? Correct. It, it keeps, yeah, obviously nitrogen stabilizers keep nitrogen from, from being lost. Not Maybe not necessarily more available, for, but from being lost. And you can look at 
a Vale T5 and say it keeps phosphorus from getting fixed over time and being lost, so to speak, right? So yes, you, you make a good point. What I'll tell you is that when we apply MAP or DAP or ammonium polyphosphate, which is our liquid suspension, the phosphorus source in our liquid suspensions, they are as available as they're ever gonna be the minute you apply them. And then with time, they slowly become less available, okay? What I think of ALT5 is doing, I think of ALT5 is keeping a larger proportion of that available for longer. So we know that corn, for example, it takes up phosphorus all season long. Is it arguably most important to make sure you have a high concentration of phosphorus early for corn? Yes, it is. But it takes up phosphorus all year long. So making sure we have some phosphorus that continues to be plant available, highly plant available, throughout the growing season, I think is very important. And that's why I think I've, I've seen what I've seen with a male T5. Okay, Jake, so what about, like you just mentioned this, your phosphorus levels in the field, does that matter for a VLT5? Yeah, and that's part of the thing that we really need to get into, but probably don't have a ton of time today. But in brief, it, you know, we will see the, the biggest, the, the, the most consistent and highest yielding results from using VLT5 whenever, whenever you have pHs that are, you know, roughly below 5.5, five, 5.3, five, and roughly above 7.2 or so because it's at the the non-optimum ends of the pH scale where phosphorus is most intensely fixed, okay? Uh, so, you know, th that would be important in low testing phosphorus soils because it's really important to make sure you keep as much plant available phosphorus as possible. It would be most profitable, even if you have high soil test levels in soils that have relatively higher or lower pHs. So, you know, those would be the sweet spots. That said, I have to tell you that I've seen a lot of yield increases in a lot of places where I wouldn't necessarily expect phosphorus fix, fix, fixation to be a huge problem. So theoretically speaking, yes, at, at, at very high and low pHs, we would expect it to work very consistently. Um, in low soil test levels, we would, see it, we would definitely see it work very consistently. But I'm not completely convinced that even at moderate soil test levels and somewhat normal pHs, it, it won't work fairly consistently. I mean, those are things that I need to kind of go back and, and refine a little bit, but but it, it's been very surprising in how effective it's been. Okay, last piece, Jake. Um, spring application, fall application, do you see a bump out of either one of those? Um, I, I have done this work in both the fall and the spring, and I've seen yield increases in both the fall and the spring. Uh, if I had a gut check, I would say that I would it'd be most likely, more likely to see yield increases applied in the fall because there's a little more time for that phosphorus to be fixed over time. So that's the gut check but I have not tested it uh, in that direct way, spring versus fall. I actually have a trial that I put out this fall where we will be doing that because of my speculation, but you know I don't have those results yet, so I can't say. Okay, Jake, this next one is really exciting. It's our exact strip application, and it's about fertilizer placement and keeping that liquid suspension close to the row. So, I guess I'll turn it over to you, otherwise I'll share all the excitement. Okay, that sounds good, Katie. I'll, I'll, I'll take it away. So, yes, so, you know, we have talked about a couple of products that you can buy up until this point, but now we're kind of veering off into some of my, you know, crop management trials that I do. And so, in this case, we're using the same products we've always used. We're just going to apply them and place them differently to continue to maximize yield and, and profitability for our customers. Right? Well, technology's change and so we have to change too and this is one way we're doing it. Absolutely, that's absolutely right. So historically speaking, uh, when you compare our 15 inch dribble band placement to, to broadcast fertilizer over about 16 different locations throughout the last seven years, there's about a five bushel yield increase to using the 15 inch dribble bands, right? But my job is to make sure we do better and continue to offer, you know, better products and services and technologies to our customer, right? So what I'm charged with is can we do better, right? So this has developed over time, but what I've decided that we should do going forward, you know, for, for folks that this will work with is that we should start sharing guidance information. So if, so if a farmer has RTK guidance and we have RTK guidance, we can basically apply fertilizer where the crop is gonna be planted, okay, on that row, okay? And to understand if that was feasible, we had to do some commercial stuff in field with equipment, measuring how close we could be. 
but also we had to do some small plot trials understanding how close do we need to be to get a, to get a yield increase, right? So there was a series of studies that I've done over the last two years. I have about five site years, so five fields in total where these trials were replicated six to eight times per location. So we looked at placing suspension bands, zero, three, six, nine, 12, 15 inches from where the corn was gonna be planted and then we had a broadcast treatment, okay? What we see average of those five locations is we see that generally the closer you place that suspension fertilizer to where the corn's gonna be planted, the higher the yield. So as we get closer to the crop, yields creep up, right? So at the zero placement, we, we, we see about seven bushels per acre higher yields than the broadcast treatment, okay? And we see about uh, 8.3 bushels better than the 15 inch treatment. Okay? And that is um, rate to rate, so it's the same It's so all the same rate, it's just where do you place it within the row, that's it. So, you know, you can contact one of our local salesmen to find out a lot more details about that, but uh, you know, it's, it's something that is exciting. It's something that I think will really take off. Jake, you said what exact strip <clears throat> is, but now let's talk about who this is going to work for. So, you know, oftentimes I think about getting that placement right there on the row. I think about strip till, and I also think about farmers having labor shortages, just like everybody else. And strip till just takes a long time to get anything done. So how does this help a strip till farmer? Yeah, Katie. So I think that's a great question. I don't want to. I don't want to pigeonhole it to, uh, only to strip till farmers, okay. but but I think that it it uh, definitely has a fit for folks who do strip tillage, right? So strip. I I just gonna lay it out there. I'm a big fan of strip tillage, agronomically speaking. Okay, I think that there are some real tangible benefits to no-till, but there's also some disadvantages to no-till, right? So. Strip till is a nice happy medium between getting the advantages of no-till and still keeping the advantages of tillage. So I think it's a great production system. The hitch is uh, it's time consuming, right? So if you're if you have a large operation, how do you get all your corn and soybeans harvested and then still have time to get those strips made before it freezes up, right? So it can be a very labor intensive thing. So that's exactly why we developed you know, that's part of the reason why we developed exact strip because now the farmer wouldn't have to purchase all the plumbing, all the tanks, all the pumps associated with a strip till machine. They wouldn't have to worry about stopping to, 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 uh, to, you know, to get tendered or for us being up on the weekends or for us working all night. I mean, it, we just think it, it would be a lot more efficient. If, if you like strip tillage, let us blow the fertilizer on the strip after you're done strip tilling or let us pull the fertilizer on and then you incorporate with your strip till machine. Do you see a difference in what you just mentioned there? That is a great question, Katie. <laughs> and uh, it just leads me to my next point. Oh, good. <laughs> How did I know? <laughs> so, so, so with new technology, there's lots of questions. Okay. And so this is something that we're, we're, we're still developing to be frank. I mean, we, we know what we know and all we know is great. But there's still a lot of questions to be answered. So one question I've had from our customers and our salesmen is, if I'm using this in a strip till system, do I apply the fertilizer and then do I incorporate it? Or do I apply the fertilizer on top of the, the strips after it's done? And how does that compare to injecting at six to seven inches deep like you normally would with a strip till machine, right? So I've got, I'm starting to answer part of that question, and we just got a strip till bar this spring, an actual strip till bar. We had a different strip till bar, but this one's much better. Um, and I had to plumb it, uh, threw it together, plumbed it at the last minute uh, this spring. So we did get a few trials out there, but probably not all the comparisons we wanted, and we will get all those comparisons. Just give me a, give me a couple years here, okay? <laughs> but to start off with, I have answered the question. If you were going to apply a strip till band and then incorporate it versus injecting fertilizer six to seven inches deep, which is pretty standard when you're talking about strip till, how did those compare? Okay. And the good news is, is they were, when we're talking about potassium, because this study specifically involved potassium, potassium placement. When we're talking about potassium, what I found is that either injecting it six to seven inches deep or applying the fertilizer and then incorporating with the strip till machine 
both yielded more than broadcast applying that same 100 pounds of potassium. So that's good. So both are better, okay? Now on average, the when you incorporate that exact strip strip with a, with a strip till machine, we saw about an 8.6 bushel yield increase over broadcast. And on average, we saw about a 6.6 .6 bushel increase over broadcast by injecting that same 100 pound, pounds of potassium six to seven inches deep. So both were good. Statistically, they were no different. But I would say at minimum, uh, applying the exact strip and then incorporating it with the strip to machine is as good as injecting that fertilizer six to seven inches. That's what I can say at minimum. So more questions to answer, more to come on this subject, but that's the answer uh, on, that, on that question for right now. Okay, Jake, um, I think about what we're trying to do here in the farmer's sense, um, labor shortages, time shortages, larger operations, and a strip till machine. Um, if Diesel prices, let's talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna come put this fertilizer on with exact strip, I really don't wanna run my machine too, and spend more diesel to get across this just to do a little tillage. Is the planter enough tillage in the springtime to make this happen? Or do you have to have tillage at all to work it in? No, you don't have to, I, yeah, no. I mean, and no, you do not, because that's exactly how I did most of my distance studies. It was in no-till. And I did it in no-till specifically because when you're starting off looking at a new practice like this, you don't want to introduce multiple factors at one time. So most of these trials were done in no-till. So if you're a no-tiller, I would say absolutely it works. If you're a minimum tiller, so for, so for example, if you hit your corn residue in the fall with a vertical tillage machine, and you chop up that residue and you're going to come back and you're going to plant soybeans into it or maybe you're going to plant corn back into it. You know, we could come in and, and put this strip on after you do the vertical tillage. You know, <laughs> we're not going to come in and put it on after you, you know, chisel. somebody chisels. Because <laughs> number one, the band's not going to be very straight. Number two, our guys are not going to be pleased. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so it's not just for strip tillers. For a guy that does minimum tillage or no tillage, it would work great too. So you just said about beans here, and there's guys that have beans in 30 inch rows, 15s, you know, even drilled. Um, can we make this exact strip work on 30 inch rows and 15 inch rows? Yeah, we can. Um, I have not done those trials yet. I'm starting this coming growing season, but I've got a lot of questions about well, what about soybeans, right? So I don't have the trials done. My initial gut says, uh, I don't know why it wouldn't be beneficial in soybeans. That's my initial gut reaction. But I would keep it on the 15 inch centers. You know, uh, you know, even if you're doing 30 inch beans, I would just run those beans down one of the strips. Um, I don't necessarily think that you have to put it all, you have to plant those beans all in that 30 inch strip, if that makes sense. I get a little bit worried about chloride toxicity in soybeans, which is why I'm saying that. Um, if it's done in the fall, I'm not super worried about it, but this is exactly why I need to take a look at this in the plots to make sure we're not recommending something that is going to be detrimental at the end of the day. Okay, last question, Jake. If a guy has his lines already from planting, do we use those or do we recreate the lines and give them back to the farmer? Well, or we can you do either. We could do either. Um, preferably, if the farmer has the lines created already, that's preferable because the farmer obviously has created those lines because he likes where the lines are and, it, and he can just give us those lines and then we can manipulate them to go into our machines. Now, if you don't have those lines created or you don't have those lines saved, because sometimes that's also an issue, yes, we can make those lines and work with you to position them where you want them or what direction you want them in a field. So preferable if you have your lines, but that doesn't mean you can't do it if you don't have your lines. Any other last comments on this slide? Um, no more last comments. I would just say that I'm really excited about this new technology we're offering. I really do think it's gonna help our customers uh, you know, take it to the next level of profitability with, with little investment. Okay, Jake, I know for some of the folks at home, they're probably going, um, this is a lot, when's it gonna end? But other folks are probably saying, this is so good, I hope this goes all day long. So if you are interested, we are going to have Winter Lead Academies, virtual and in-person, and Dr. Jake will be sharing a lot of information at those. So check out our website, check out our social, and make sure we get um, the information out there and you can get signed up for that. So this next topic is called balanced nutrition study. And you know, we often talk about nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, but there's some other stuff that can come along with it to make those macros work a little bit better. So sure. 
Yep. So Katie, um, this study that have you already mentioned is called Balanced Nutrition. So, you know, why does uh, all of our pickups say balanced fertilizers on their side? There's a reason for that actually, okay? And to make a very long story short, when these nutrients are applied together, sometimes we call that co-application, there's some things that happen between these nutrients that make many of them more plant available, okay? And I talked about this at length in a, in a, a, a another video, another Lead Academy session all on its own, okay? And we will definitely provide that link, that link okay? But to make a very long technical story short, um, phosphorus uh, uptake is enhanced when you apply nitrogen sources with them, which would include the nitrogen and the ammonium polyphosphate, it would include the nitrogen and the ammonium thiosulfate, um, and zinc uh, availability can also be greatly enhanced by applying it with ammonium thiosulfate. Okay, and that's because ammonium thiosulfate in that band drops the pH and zinc is much more plant available at low pHs than it is at high pHs. And ammonium thiosulfate is ATS um, more commonly, and that is our sulfur source that we Correct. use primarily right. in the springtime, um, but also in the fall too. Yep. So I show you this study here. It's called my balanced nutrition study. And what it says is that, you know, nitrogen's good, potassium's good, phosphorus is good and they all increase yields, and this is over multiple locations, okay? But when you add all those together, the yield increases are much higher than any of them applied independently, okay? And that's because of those interactions and those synergies that occur between those nutrients. So it's a real systems approach. It's a real systems approach, and the bottom line is that when you co-apply these nutrients together, it, it, it's beneficial for nutrient uptake, yield, and profitability, and you can't do that with dry fertilizer. That's part of the reason why we see higher yields using these suspension fertilizers because of the co-application effect. Um, which brings us into our next study. Okay, so I spent a lot of time throughout the last seven years developing a out of furrow starter fertilizer that would be that would maximize corn yield. Okay, and I've played around with different materials at different rates and so on and so forth. And what we arrived at is a product called 18333. So that means it has 18% nitrogen, 3% phosphorus, 3% potassium, 3% sulfur, and 0.12% zinc, okay? And, and I've seen astonishing results with that product and um, it, it's been very good uh, it, you know, in, in, in my plots relative to other starter programs. Now, the study I'm going to talk about involves cover crops, right? So my job isn't to, it's not to answer the question of, of today, it's to answer the question of five to ten years down the road. What, where do we need to be looking in the future, right? And you can be a cover crop fan, you can hate cover crops, that's not what we're here to talk about today. But the reason I did that study is because if cover crops do take off, we need to know how to manage corn in cover crops, okay? So the cover crop that I use was cereal rye. And, uh, you know, you, you have to, you really have to be careful with cereal rye and corn. You have to make sure you're managing it appropriately. And I just gave a talk, a long talk about this at the, the fluid fertilizer conferences yesterday. Um, and we can probably find that link and provide that link too. But the bottom line is, uh, we believe that an out of furrow starter with a good shot of nitrogen, it's really important to make sure that you maintain corn yields when you plant corn in the cereal rye. So why does this have to be out of furrow instead of in the furrow? Because the, the nutrients that we're using, the nutrients that the corn needs when you're planting, uh, planting corn in the cover crops, they, they, would, call, they would cause uh, salt injury, salt injury to, to the to And the so seeds. when you say out of furrow, are you laying this on top or are you doing a two by two? Well, you could do two by two. You could dribble it on top of the row, two to three inches from the so row. So there's options. There's options, okay. yep. And that's why I say out of furrow because that can mean multiple application methods out of furrow. But um, in the study I'm gonna talk about next, uh, I, I, I put it on the soil surface on both sides of the row, about three inches from the row, okay? So what we did is this is average over three locations, and and in general, uh, this this relates very well to my balanced nutrition study, right? So 
when you just applied nitrogen with the planter, we used 60 pounds of nitrogen, we saw about a 3.3 bushel yield increase. When you applied uh, 60 pounds of nitrogen and 10 pounds of P, we saw about a 9.3 bushel yield increase. When you applied N, P, and K, you saw about an 11.5 bushel yield increase. But then we get to the sulfur. So the sulfur was the key. We go from 11.5 bushel yield increase all the way to a 27 bushel yield increase. So we see a big change in yield when we, when we add that sulfur to that mix. And then when we add the zinc to that mix, we see another six to seven bushel yield increase. And now that's when all these nutrients are combined and they are co-applied. And that goes back to my balanced nutrition study and what we've seen in this cover crop study. Now that, what I just mentioned, was averaged over with cover crops and without cover crops. It really gets exciting when you just look at what happened when you planted corn into the cereal rye. So instead of that, you know, nine bushel yield increase in sulfur, we got a 22, basically and a half bushel yield increase for adding 10 pounds of sulfur to that system with cereal rye. So that tells us that in cereal rye, sulfur is a big key component of why sometimes we see yield decreases when we plant corn into cereal rye and how important sulfur is. So sulfur increased yields dramatically in that study, particularly with cereal rye. Zinc was very impressive with or without uh, uh, cereal rye, six to seven bushel yield increase. And I, I see, I'm starting to see just very consistent, very big yield increases with zinc and corn. So Jake, the guy doesn't have a starter system on his planter today, and we all know what the equipment industry is like right at this moment. You might not get one between now and spring. Um, what if we just use like in our weed and feed some ATS and some nitrogen there? Are you going to see some of the same effects you're, as you would as out of furrow starter that you're talking you're about? You're going to see, well, you're going to get yield increases from the sulfur. There's no question. Um, I would argue that that these two co-applied together in a band, you, you'd see even uh, greater yield increases, which is why I'm a big believer in these out of furrow starters. I understand the logistics, but I would say that you're going to get some of the same thing with the exact strip. And that's exactly why, that's part of the reason why we went down this road, because what I've seen with these out of furrow starters in my plots, that you know there is a substantial yield increase relative to broadcasting these nutrients, okay? And so, I think you can get some of that starter effect by using the exact strip technology. So you can get what I'm seeing without having to have all the stuff hanging on your planter. Okay, and this, these are all the reasons together why we moved to that exact strip technology. Okay, Jake, that was a lot, but let's just do a quick little recap here if I can remember. You guys asked for a research update and I'm giving it to you. I know, thank you. So Avail T5. Uh, placement is in furrow or in suspension fertilizer. Uh, how many bushels are you going to see out of that? Uh, yeah. uh, on average, I think I saw about 12 this year. Uh, long term, I'm, I'm in that about seven and a half range. Sure. So a little higher this year than average, but seven to 12 bushel, that's going to be profitable either way. Micro AZ in placement? Uh, in furrow or two by two or close to the furrow, so that out of furrow. Um, and res results that you're seeing out of that? Uh, long term, I've saw about a four and a half bushel yield increase on average, but again, this year I saw larger yield increases, eight to nine bushel yield increases in 2022 at every single site. Okay, exact strip application? Uh, exact strip application, super excited about it. Still have a lot to learn, but what I'm seeing so far is about seven bushel greater yields for planting on zero versus the broadcast application. Um, you were talking about balanced nutrition. What's all in our balanced nutrition? What nutrients? Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, zinc. Okay. And I think the last thing you mentioned just briefly was about cover crops. Yeah. So the, 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 the take home message with the planting corn and the cereal rye is that nitrogen was important and sulfur was extremely important. And just in general, I see really consistent responses out of sulfur, not only this year, but years previous. My long-term running average yield increase is about seven and a half bushels per acre for 15 pounds of sulfur. Um, we see lots of sulfur deficiencies in the spring and sulfur is extremely important in crop production today. 
Well, thanks so much for being here with us today, Jake. And hopefully this gives you guys at home something to talk to your salesmen about as we go into this chemical prepay season and prepare for our 2023 season. And don't forget, we have our lead academies coming up this winter. They'll be online and in person. So check out our social and our website for registration on that. And we hope you have a great day. Thank you very much.